Hello, everyone. My name is Allie Virtue, and I am a functional medicine nutritionist and owner of Parkside Nutrition. So today we are starting a series of explaining diets. So why they work, why they don't work, pros, cons, so you can make an informed decision. Maybe you can take some things that work really well from a certain diet for you and change things that aren't working for you. So my goal is to just educate on how diets work. So let's dig into it. So how diets work or how they don't work. We're going to start off with a ketogenic or keto diet. So uh, these are the other diets that I plan to cover, but let's dig into keto first. So keto or ketogenic diet uh, typically is defined by 70 to 75% of the calories coming from fat sources. So this pyramid kind of roughly outlines that. You can see this it is here at the bottom. We have salmon, butter, cheese, some seafood, eggs, red meat, oils, olives, things like that. We have some other plants here in the middle. And at the top, we have some fruits or higher carb things. And that kind of is a visual rep representation of, of this diet. So 15 to 20% of our calories is coming from protein. So relatively small amount as far as the whole diet. And then five to 10% of calories is coming from carbohydrates. So a very, very small portion of the diet is coming from carbs. And then originally this diet was popularized in the 1900s as a treatment for epilepsy. It was not a weight loss strategy, but it was very effective at treating epilepsy in children. So how does keto work? So ketogenic diet, this is when your body is fairly depleted of carbohydrates. This is the preferred energy source for the body. This is our quick fuel. And that initial weight loss that a lot of people see is water weight. So carbohydrates, carbs hold water. This mimics kind of a fasted state because we don't have that readily available energy as in carbohydrates. This also mimics a catabolic state. So this is when it the body does not have enough energy to build, to build muscle, things like that. It's mimicking a catabolic state when we are breaking our own tissues down for fuel. So just to go over some hormones, glucagon. So glucagon is high. So when glucagon is high, this is the hormone that signals our liver to put more sugar or energy into the blood for other tissues to use as energy. Insulin is low in this state because insulin tells us that we've just eaten, there's glucose in our system, there's glucose in our blood, we need to store it so we can lower our blood sugar, we need to store it in our tissues. So insulin is really low in a ketogenic state, which can be good for addressing insulin resistance, but it also has some detriments as far as like building muscle and things like that. You can think of insulin as our storage hormone. We're telling our body to take the sugar out of our blood and put it in our tissues. So this is a really slow process. So when you hear of someone starting a ketogenic diet, it can take a couple of days. One, because we're going to go through our glycogen. Glycogen stores are in our liver and in our muscles. And it's going to take a while to use those up for energy before we start to tap into that ketogenic state where we start to use ketones for energy. Um, and this is a really slow process because hormone sensitive lipase, that's the hormone that tells our body that, hey, we actually need to break down our fat tissue. We need to, need to release them into circulation. We have to transport them to the liver and then the liver has to start processing them for energy. And so one of the reasons that takes a little bit longer is because fat is a really large molecule. But when we think about energy in general, a carbohydrate, so one molecule of glucose, that's this up here, is turned into 38 units of ATP. So ATP is literally what our cells use for energy and one fatty acid. So a fatty acid is here. So you can see this is a big, long molecule. And each of these points here, if you can see that, is a carbon molecule. So there's lots more carbon in fatty acids than there are one, two, three, four, five, six in glucose. There's a lot more energy stored in fat than there is in glucose. You can see that here, 128 units of ATP versus 38. So it's a lot more, right? So this takes a little bit longer. This also is a very nutrient dependent process. So to get this big molecule, this is a big molecule into, you can see here that this is a graph of a cell and you see these little squiggle lines here. This is an organelle called the mitochondria. And this is a big version of the mitochondria here, but it takes a special um, step to get these large fatty acids, these large fat molecules into the mitochondria to be actually be processed, broken down. You kind of snip them into shorter chains to release that energy. Um, and this requires carnitine and carnitine is found in, in meats. Usually it's not necessarily deficient, but if someone is having a really hard time fasting, this could be a sign of carnitine deficiency, or they could be missing some other key nutrients that require, that are required in that particular steps to actually process that those fat molecules for fuel. 
And this occurs in the liver, small intestines, and kidneys. So a limited source, not all tissues do this. Red blood cells require glucose. They cannot use fatty acids for energy. So this is, this is again, a catabolic state. This is kind of a backup mechanism. This is not necessarily when we are functioning optimally um, on a regular basis. Okay, so some pros to con, pros and cons about the ketogenic diet. So that was a little bit of the how it works. Let's look at the pros and cons as far as lifestyle. So I will tell you before I dig into this, as a nutritionist, I see a lot of people who have tried keto in the past. I see very, very few people that have done it on a long-term basis and they've you know, done it in a sustainable way. I think it can be good temporarily, but not usually as a long-term strategy. Pros, it's mostly whole foods. So like any diet, it can be done well, it can be done really poorly. So if you do it well, I think it focuses on mostly whole foods. If we think about our pyramid there, there's a lot of whole foods there. It's olives, it's animal proteins, it's butter, hopefully some fermented dairy in there as well, some plants in there, and very minimal sugar. And you can have those carbohydrates in small amounts. I'm not too crazy if we're looking at that version of keto. Now, if we're looking at keto products and I'm having keto brownies and keto this and keto breads, that's maybe not such a good version of keto for long term. Let's see, with any diet that restricts or emphasizes certain macros, you're going to learn a little bit more about macronutrients. So you're going to learn what happens has higher carbs, what has high fiber, what has low fat, what's a high fat food. So that is good as far as an education standpoint, you learn a little bit more about that. It lowers appetite. Fat stays in the digestive system or in your stomach in particular a lot longer. It slows gastric emptying. So when we put a lot of high fat foods in our stomach, the foods are going to stay there a little bit longer. They're going to be slower to move through to the small intestine. And that keeps one, our blood sugar fairly stable because we don't have a huge increase in carbs. We're not eating very many carbs anyway. And then it lowers our appetite because our food is going to take a little bit longer to move through. Not in a bad way, but just a little bit longer. So that can be an advantage. It usually cuts down on snacking for that reason because we're not as hungry. We're very satisfied. It can also improve insulin resistance. That's what IR stands for. So again, we're not really signaling insulin too much because we're not having a ton of carbohydrates coming in into the system. So that can improve the sensitivity there. Cons, like I said, not terribly sustainable for a lot of people. Some people can, for the majority, not very sustainable simply because how do I navigate holidays, birthdays, things like that? How do I find keto options when I'm traveling? Things like that. And if someone is switching out of a ketogenic state on and off, you probably won't feel very good. So for that person, maybe they do keto, they felt really good on keto. And so maybe they do an initial three months of, of keto and they feel really good, but they want to move to a sustainable version of it. Maybe then they just use a low carbohydrate diet, higher fat diet, low carbohydrate, but they don't need to necessarily be in a ketogenic state and measure their ketones and things like that. So there's lots of high calorie foods with keto as well, because one gram of fat is nine calories versus one gram of protein or one gram of carbohydrate is four calories. So if I have a lot more fat on my plate, I'm going to have a lot more calories on my plate. The downfall with keto is it doesn't always talk about the portion sizes of things. And so again, this can lead to weight gain. You can very easily have too many calories than your body requires because those fats, those calories are just very condensed in those high fat foods. This is not a good option for athletes, athletes, especially of an explosive nature. So a sprinter or endurance, um, endurance event athletes, they need carbohydrates for fuel. They absolutely need that. They need that for carbohydrates are important for building muscle as well. So strength based athletes, this is just usually not a good option for them. This is also not good for people who don't have a gallbladder. A gallbladder is a small pouch that is near the liver. And when you ingest, when you ingest fat, the gallbladder is signaled to contract and that releases bile salts or bile acids into the small intestine to help digest those, those fat, fatty foods that you just ingested. Now, if I don't have a gallbladder, my liver is slowly releasing bile salts on a continuous basis, but I won't have enough to digest a higher fat meal if I don't have that stored pouch, aka the gallbladder to digest those things. So this could be a very, very hard diet. And I would not recommend this for anyone who has gallbladder issues or does not have a gallbladder period. Yes, you can supplement with things, um, but I don't think that's a good long-term strategy. And then this can negatively in impact gut bacteria. So if you are not feeding them high fiber diets, you could starve out some beneficial bacteria. You could accidentally increase some negative bacteria. So want to be really careful with that and still make sure we're consuming enough fiber, enough plant foods to maintain a healthy gut as well. This is not compatible for some people just based on their genetics. Some people don't react very well to high saturated fats or high content of red meat. So we need to be aware of that too. Monitoring blood work is a great way to see if this is 
to see if this is the case for you. And then here's some examples. So this could be a ketogenic diet for someone, two eggs in the morning, uh, some spinach, mushrooms, garlic. Those are very low carbohydrate vegetables. And then for lunch, maybe that's chicken thighs. Chicken thighs have a little bit higher fat. Again, not, we're not going to have a ton of protein with this. So portions are very moderate. And then olives, pine nuts are really high in fat as well. Tomatoes, very low carb. Avocado, high fat. Salad, lettuce, very low carb. Dressing, usually very low fat. So that lines up really well. Steak, usually a higher fat meat. So that works. Again, modest portion. And then roasted broccoli, cauliflower, very low carbohydrate vegetables. Celery and peanut butter. And then day two, chia and hemp seeds. And this is overnight oats. So no oats overnight oats so that instead of having oats which is a higher carb food you can do the same kind of thing but with chia seeds and hemp seeds those seeds absorb a lot of water so you can soak them overnight and add some blueberries add some other nuts and seeds and that could be a breakfast that doesn't include eggs but still lines up pretty well with the ketogenic diet grilled salmon very high fat protein source there asparagus low carb with lemon could add some other vegetables in the mix as well but no rice with that particular option. And then a bunless burger. So we're moving the carbs of the burger bun and just focusing on the burger with some grilled zucchini and other side salads, other low carb options. A snack could be deli turkey or an avocado roll up. So rolling up those slices of avocado in some sort of protein source could be another good snack option. Nuts, seeds, berries could be another good snack option that's not on these days. So hopefully that gives you an idea of what a ketogenic diet could look like. I think this is a stellar ketogenic diet, to be honest. Again, some people will do like keto bread and a lot of keto food products that are highly processed. And again, we're missing out on adding those uh, low carb vegetables that have a lot of the nutrition that we need as well. So I think these are honestly pretty good days of keto if we are going to do that. So go ahead, if you have any questions at this point, go ahead and drop those in the comments below. And I will try to get back to you if you have any questions on the ketogenic diet in particular. And stay tuned for the next episode of how diets work and how they don't. Lastly, make sure you hit subscribe and you subscribe to the email list at parksidenutrition.com for more free resources and downloads like this. 